very happy to introduce this evening's uh, guest speaker. I'm standing in for Cat tonight. Um, tonight's speaker is Michael M. Hughes. Mike is a uh, Baltimore-based writer. He specializes in fiction and nonfiction. He, his best-selling debut novel, Blackwater Lights, was published last year by Hydra, which is a random house in print. And he is currently working on a sequel. Um, he lives in Baltimore, with, as I mentioned, with his wife and daughter. And when he's not writing, he performs as a mentalist and speaks on accordion and paranormal topics. Something that's near and uh, Mike's going to be speaking to us tonight about the long journey from first draft to publication, with an emphasis on his good and bad experiences with uh, the new digital imprint at a major publisher. I guess I can take that one to uh, He's going to be discussing craft, process, agents, ebooks, marketing, and just about any other kind of any variation on the topics that you'd like to ask him. So, as you listen, please think of your questions and uh, Please welcome Mike Hughes. Thanks, Paul, and thanks everybody for coming out in a very hot uh, evening. Um, normally I'd show you the cover uh, of the book on my iPad, but one of my kids happened to reach into my backpack and hijack my iPad, so uh, there's the cover of the book. <laughs> um, it's, it's tough, they always want to get their, their hands on that. But um, yeah, well, one thing I'm going to talk about tonight is what it's like to be a, an author for a digital only imprint. Uh, Hydra, which is my publisher, is actually Random House's first digital only imprint, their first foray into it. And that, you know, there's, there's a lot of good things that come with that, and there's a lot of, you know, stuff uh, that you know, was, a, was a little difficult and required some navigating ways. You have new ways, really figuring out new ways how to do things. Number one being a book signing, uh, which you can't really do that well. And there, there have been some technological developments uh, it's, that allow you to sort of sign on someone's Kindle or their iPad or something like that, but they're not quite there yet. So what I do, and afterwards, uh, if anyone would like to have a bunch of these postcards, I'm happy to sign a postcard for you. Uh, so that, that, that's been my way around it. Um, well, first I'll do a reading, a short uh, little bit from the book to give you kind of an idea about it, and then talk about my path from writing my book to publication, which is a path of close to a decade uh, at this point right now. And I, I like to do that because I think when, when I see other writers talk, I like to listen to their stories. I like to know how they got from one place to another. And I find that that's been very helpful to me. So I hope that'll be helpful to you. And again, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so you know, save your questions if you can. Let me tell you a little bit about the book. Uh, it takes place in West Virginia. I'll just set the scene for the reading. The protagonist is a man named Ray Simon, who's a school teacher in Baltimore. And at the beginning of the story, uh, we find out that Ray went to a summer camp when he was a kid with his friend Kevin. They were like seven, eight years old. Something happened at that summer camp, and they're not quite sure what happened, but they, they've both been having, through their lives really, uh, dreams and unsettling nightmares about something that happened at this camp. And some of the imagery in their dreams has been doctors, some sorts of machines they may have been hooked up to, um, a bunch of children being paraded out into the woods. Uh, but, but, but they don't remember anything, and they haven't been able to get any information about what happened at this camp. So that's really the central mystery that begins the book. When this sequence begins, Ray has just gotten a call from his friend Kevin who had also been at the camp with him. And Kevin essentially calls him up and says, Ray, I know what happened. I figured it out. It happened here in West Virginia. I'm here now. You've got to come see me. And Ray says, look, I, I can't just drop everything and come out and see you. He says, you have to. This really explains it. I figured out what it was, and you've got to see it yourself. So at this point, Ray has gotten in his Toyota Corolla drove five or six hours from Baltimore to the town of Blackwater, West Virginia, which isn't a real town. There's a town called Blackwater Falls, but uh, there's no real Blackwater. And when he shows up, he pulls up to Kevin's uh, house, 
and Kevin's not there, but Kevin has left a key for him and a note saying, hey, had to fly to Portland, be back as soon as I can, make yourself at home. So that's where we start. Ray popped open another beer and sat on the porch as the last pink swath of sunlight faded over the mountain ridge. The noises of the insects and the frogs were deafening. He could barely hear himself think over the chirping, buzzing, and droning. It wasn't a pleasant sound. There was an undercurrent, like an electrical tower, and overlaying it were call and response, click, click, click noises from different directions, the night talking to itself. If Kevin was right about Blackwater, something had happened to both of them in this tiny, dreary town almost 40 years ago. Now that he was here, he knew somehow that it was true. This was the place. The memories felt like they were bulging against the inside of his skull, close to breaking out. But the thought of what Kevin might reveal made him more than a little afraid. Maybe there was a reason what had happened was shoveled so deep. Maybe his mind was doing him a favor by keeping it hidden for so long. It's happening again, Kevin had said to him on the phone. Ray shuddered. No need to think about it now, not all by himself in the middle of the God-forsaken backwoods. He needed a night without another of the dreams. In the distance, an orange glow appeared against the black void of the forest. It flared up then brightened against the treetops. Eh, probably just drunken hunters illegally spotlighting deer or whatever other critters they like to shoot and eat in these parts. His arm jerked and knocked over his beer. It hit the floor of the deck and sprayed on his leg, gushing foam. The orange light was moving fast, directly towards the house. Then it split into two. Twin blobs of light zipping through the sky just above tree level until they seemed like they'd crash into the house. Ray recoiled, holding up his hands in front of his face. For an instant, the entire yard looked like it was on fire. Just as quickly, they passed overhead. He jumped to his feet. In the distance, the lights hovered, their glow reflecting off the low-lying clouds and illuminating the tree line below. They wobbled, suspended in the air, and plunged straight down into the darkness of the forest. The woods were again deep black. The afterimage burned in his retinas, painting the night with phantom trails. He ticked through a list of possibilities, but nothing made sense. They weren't any kind of aircraft, too fast and too small for that, and they hadn't made a sound. They had traveled from the far ridge to the house in seconds. And they were too slow for meteors. Plus, what kind of meteors flew straight over treetops, hovered momentarily, and dropped straight down to the ground? Maybe it was ball lightning. He'd read about that once, how it could roll through an open door and out a window without burning anything. Unless it touched you, of course. In which case, you were reduced to a pile of greasy ash. Ball lightning was the only real explanation. The sole other option, the one that seemed as he stood staring into the night to be the most obvious, was not even worth considering. It contradicted all he knew to be sane, rational, and real. And to consider it required looking into a deep, bottomless hole. He'd seen people like that on TV, wide-eyed proselytizers talking about how Big-headed aliens took them into spaceships and stuck probes where the sun didn't shine. Those people. He stood staring into the darkness until raindrops splattered on top of his head. The hair on his arms bristled. Definitely time to go inside. He locked the doors. His mind raced replaying the light show and he watched the clock change to 3 a.m. before he fell asleep. Someone was in the yard. Well, that's, that should give you a little idea of this kind of book. Um, 
And you know, as we get deeper in, we do find out what, what these lights are. And, and uh, they're, they're a little different than, than maybe um, you may suspect. Excuse me? Blackwater lights. And this, the central mystery is these, well, what these lights are in this town. You may have heard of other ghost lights, the Marfa lights in Texas, uh, the Brown Mountain lights, things like that. Um, so a subject that's always, that's always fascinated me. And uh, I took a lot of my, my little interests and oddities in my own life and kind of rolled them in, into this fictionally, which is how, how I like to write. Um, well, let me talk about how, how my journey and if at any point you have a burning question, feel free to ask. If, if you can hold them to the end, I'll make sure I leave plenty of time for questions, too. Um, I guess I hit sort of an early uh, midlife crisis when I was in my late 30s. Um, I realized, probably like a lot of you, that I had a bit of a gift for writing. And I'd been squandering it most of my life. And I realized if I didn't make use of this gift and didn't try to write a book, um, I would really be disappointed later in life. And I had a nice deadline in that uh, my wife was pregnant with her first child. So uh, I told myself, you know what? I'm going to write this book and I'm going to finish it before my daughter was born. And I made it by about two weeks. So uh, I actually hit that deadline, which is pretty good for someone who's never been really great with deadlines. And I'm glad I did because those of you with kids know that once that happens, Things change dramatically, and they did. Um, so I wrote this book, and uh, then I went about probably doing what a lot of you have done or in the process of doing, which is find an agent. All the books I said, I had read said you have to find an agent. So I, I did my research, found the agents that represented my kind of book. You know, I, I, I really dislike when people don't do the research about things. And I know most of the agents and editors that I've talked to drives them bonkers. If they represent, you know, cozy mysteries and romance and someone sends them a book like mine, it's, it's a total waste of their time. So I really did focus, found the agent I thought was going to be perfect for me, you know, sent it off, query, you know, sent a query off, rejection letter, you know, form rejection letter. Did that about a dozen more times, rejections, 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 kept fussing over what I was doing wrong, things like that. But I realized I, I, I went to a couple of uh, MWA meetings and met some people and things like that, got some advice. But I realized I wasn't immersed in a group of writers. Like I really, that's what I was missing. I was missing people who, were, who had done this and who knew the ins and the outs and stuff that you can't get out of a, out of a book all the time. So I heard about a, uh, a, a boot camp a writer's boot camp. I think we have another graduate of the boot camp uh, over here as well. And it was, it was fairly expensive. And you know, I had to really think, dude, do I want to spend this money for a weekend immersion in a writing workshop? And I, I really wasn't sure. I didn't know that much about the instructors, although I knew one of the instructors. I had one of his books on my bookshelf when I was a kid. So I thought, well, you know, at least there's, there's something. Um, his name is uh, Tom Monteleone. So, you know, I went back and forth, talked to my wife about it, said, yeah, I realize it's a lot of money, but this, this may really help. You know, it's, it's worth a shot. She agreed, said, go do it. So it's called the Borderlands Boot Camp. It still exists. It happens every year. I went in with a little trepidation. I'd read some of the other people who were uh, the grunts. Since it's a boot camp, they called us all grunts. Read some of the other grunts' materials. Some of it was fantastic. Some of it was eh. So I really wasn't sure what I was getting into. And uh, so I showed up. They don't, my, the first time I sat down with, with Tom Monteleone, who runs the boot camp. He's got a couple other writers, some of you, well, some of you guys may know from uh, reading their books. And Tom handed my manuscript back to me, and I was shaking, you know. Uh, and he said, who's your agent? And you know, all the other, all the other grunts were sitting there. It was about four or five of them. They're staring. I said, I don't have an agent, you know, that's why I'm here. He goes, well, what else have you written? I said, well, nothing. This is my first book. I haven't, he goes, you haven't published anything? I said, no, no. He said, well, this is, this, I didn't even mark this up. This is good. It's ready to go. 
And at that point, I swear, I was sitting down, but I, I think I levitated about a foot <laughs> off the ground, you know, and, and the, everyone's jaws dropped and my jaws hanging down. And, you know, I, I mean, instantly visions start going through my head of, oh, you know, wow, I, I can do this, I can do this. And uh, then Tom said, well, you don't have an agent. Why don't, why don't you let me introduce, why don't you let me introduce you to my agent? At that point, I think, uh, you know, I rose another foot and everybody's jaw dropped another few inches. And um, it, it, it was really astounding. I, I, I really had no expectation something like that was going to happen. So Tom put me, after, after this was all said and done, you know, I'm dreaming about the cabin I'm going to build by the lake where I'm going to write and the movie rights and all that stuff, you know. And, and, and you can't help it, but your mind goes there and you know, dare to dream, you know. I mean, the, the, but so, uh, so Tom puts me in touch with his agent, Don, Donald Moss, who's written a bunch of books. Some of you may have read about the breakout novel, that sort of thing. Well, you know, so the, a week goes by that feels like six years, and finally Don gets back and says, you know, it's really well written, and, you know, I was, really enjoyed it. Uh, not really my thing, though. So instantly, you know, the dreams crumble before your very eyes and fall in the dust, and then, you know, I'm thinking, why did I ever do this? I'm such a loser. But I talk to Tom, and, you know, I'm probably babbling on the phone to Tom about this guy rejecting me. He says, well, how about, I have another agent. Why don't you talk to this guy? Well, this, this agent's name was Matt Bialer, and he's at Sanford J. Greenberger um, and Associates. It's a really big, Dan Brown is one of their clients. Um, Kafka, is, his estate is represented by them. So these guys are heavy hitters, and they've been around a long time. Uh, Tad Williams, who's a science fiction fantasy writer, um, Matt represents him as well. But I said to Tom, I said, Tom, I queried him. As a matter of fact, he was the very first one I sent out, the one I, I said, this is my guy, you know. I said, and Tom said, yes, he's not going to remember you. So, you know, send it again, which was true. You know, lesson number two learned. These people will not remember you. So, you know, keep, keep, keep trying. And uh, especially if you get a form letter, if something comes around later on in your career, give it another try. So, so I packed, you know, this is when you couldn't just send, uh, you know, a Word document. You had to pack the thing up. So I'm doing little, like, magical spells over it, stuff like that, sent it off. Because this is really, you know, only the second time I'd packaged up this, this book and sent it off. And again, the, the, the weeks of waiting, which, which just are the most agonizing thing. I just kept hitting refresh on my email, waiting for it to come in. And finally, after I thought I was going to die if it didn't come in, uh, I think it was about a week and a half after he got the manuscript, I get a really short email from Matt, and it says, really spooky, digging it. And that was it, you know? So then, so, you know, that's, that was fine. That's all I needed to hear at that point. So again, the fantasies of building the lakeside writing retreat start popping up and the movie rights and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this time he really did like it, and you know I was on I was on cloud nine, and so we we wrote back uh, back and forth a little bit, and then he gets back to me and says, "Okay, I've lo I've thought about it a little bit more, and here's some problems I have. Okay, it's like the the main character he's just too morose, you know, he's depressed, he's 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 boring me. So why don't you try to fix that? And he's like, and the dead kid." Um, I think you should just get rid of the dead kid, okay? Now, now here's the thing. Uh, the way I, I had put together this story, the dead kid was critical. It was Ray had a son who had been hit by a car. And that, that was the whole point. That's why Ray was depressed. That's why, um, you know, he had time to go visit Kevin. That's why his relationship had fallen apart. And this kid named Morgan... Was, was a pivotal, like his spirit, his ghost, was pivotal the whole book. I mean, it was throughout the book. And he said, so just get rid of the kid, you know. No, it's, the, I, I'm, the kid's not working for me. At this point, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you have felt this when, when you're so attached to something and someone says it's junk or that's terrible, it's not going to work. 
So I called up Tom, and I, I, I have to really credit Tom for not just hanging up the phone on me. I was, I was so ridiculous. I'm like, Tom, can you believe this? Can you believe what he's asking me? How can I do this? This is a critical part of the story. Blah, blah, blah. And went on for about 10 minutes, and Tom's you know, probably checking his watch and feeding his dogs or you know, whatever, whatever he was doing. And finally, after he let me you know, go on and on about this, he said, eh, why don't you just do what he says? And I, you know, I pretended like I didn't hear him. I'm like, but Tom, you know, your artistic vision when something's so important, and he's like, ah, just do what he says. Try, try what he says. Just do it. So after you know a couple hours, my my poor long-suffering wife had to listen to me go on about this. You know, every, everybody I talked to that was aware that I was writing, you know, had to hear me. Oh, this agent wants to decimate my my artistic vision. You know, wants to decimate this beautiful, perfect story that I've slaved for so long. Well, I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought, all right, maybe the main character is a little too morose. You know, maybe he needs to be a little more proactive. You know, um, and maybe the kid. Okay, maybe maybe I can cut the kid out of it. You know, I had these beautiful scenes where the spirit of the kid is kind of manifesting and raised. Man, all that gone. Just went through, psh, chopped it out, cut it out cut out this beautiful, touching scene where the kid gets killed and, you know, it has ramifications and everything. Just gone, gone, gone. Everything. Wiped it all out. Wiped it all out. So that required, as you know, when you take something out of a novel like that, that, that had, there are ripples throughout the novel of, of something, especially something that big as an entire character. So it took, a, I mean, it took a couple of months of just serious, you know, dogged determination, cutting, cutting, fixing, changing. And then I started thinking, maybe this, maybe this is a little bit better. I wasn't quite ready to admit that it was, it was better than it had been before. But I was like, I can, I can see this. And I, I tried to make Ray a little more proactive, a little more of a go-getter instead of a guy that things happen to. Sent it back to him, thinking this is it, got it, nailed it. And he says, eh. I don't know, Mike, you know, still not quite there. I mean, you know, Ray's just, he's kind of boring me. He's really not, I mean, you got to make him do something. You got to make him get in there. And, and, he, and he had a few suggestions. You know, again, my ego just crumbles. My entire life is wasted. Why have I spent, you know, years working on this thing? But I went back. He had a few suggestions. I tried him like this. Okay, this is actually working. This is making it a little bit better. We went through two more rounds of that, and maybe three more, actually. And this was a, over the course of a year. And finally, one day, he sends me the email. He goes, you got it. I can't think of a way to make this better. I'm going to start sending it out. Yep, that's, that was my reaction, too. You know? So again, the fantasies. I'm walking around. I got an agent, and he's sending out my book to New York, la, 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 which he proceeded to do. And it went out. And rejections came back, and it went out to him. Out, rejections. And he would send me, you know, the torture of getting these, you know, secondhand rejections from uh, editors all over the place. Some of them really like, and the worst are the ones who really actually like it. You know, this is great, man. This was scary. It was really engaging. Um, I, 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 I love the characters. I really got, you know, into their plight and all that. But, you know, for us right now, it's just not what we're looking for. And those, those are the ones where you just want to jump, drive to the Bay Bridge and just jump head first down into the water. And this kept going on and on and on. And it went on for about a year, maybe close to two years. And then he, finally I could tell that Matt was getting discouraged and moving on to other things. So uh, I started approaching small publishers. And if you know, like, it, my, my book's not really a horror book, really, in, in the classic sense. It has elements of science fiction and fantasy and stuff like that. But I, I thought maybe it would sell with some of these horror presses. So I start going for the small press. I'm like, I don't care. I'm going to get this thing out there and get it to somebody. And some of the smaller horror presses, I mean, I'm so glad it never got picked up by one of them. You know, they'll have names like Rotting Flesh Review or, you know, stuff like that that I'm really glad. And some of their covers are just the most hideous things you've ever seen. So I'm really kind of glad it didn't work. Although at the time, I was anxious for anyone, anyone to just want to publish this book. 
and people, you know, people are saying, self-publish, man, self-publish, self-publish. Self and as you know, I mean, the advocates of self-publishing are emphatic about that's what you should do. And I applaud them, and I'm, I'm all for self-publishing. I've seen some great successes. But I was also aware, in talking with my agent, talking with other writers, let's say I did self-publish this. I put it out there, and it's selling, you know, print on demand, you know, ebook, things like that. Well, if, my, if I put my next book together, and it's a fantastic book, and I send it out to an agent or, or send it out to an editor, or my agent sends it to an editor, what they're going to do is look me up, and they're going to look up BookScan or something like that, and they're going to say, huh, okay, Blackwater Lights sold about 450 copies. Never mind. You know, so yes, you can be one of the Hugh Howies of the world. You can do it, and if you can, do it, and I will be your champion as much as I am for, for traditional publishers. But I, 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 I didn't want to go that route. I didn't want to go that route. I, I, and I even tested the waters by publishing a collection of some of my short fiction. And I realized I just didn't have the marketing savvy, uh, you know, the fan base, uh, or, 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 or just the, the energy to really do what it would take to, to push that to where I wanted it to go. So I didn't. So these, you know, pretty soon these small, you know, um, you know, shredded guts press is rejecting my my book. And uh, so I, I I'd sort of given up myself, but I'd never really completely given up because whenever I'd see something for a a you know a possible opening, a publisher that might publish it, I'd I'd shoot them, a quick, or I'd get my agent to do it, or I just I start doing it myself. And finally, one day I saw, um, I think it was in Publishers Weekly, and again, the best way to, to stay on top of this for yourselves is just read about the industry. Because I would have missed this had I not read uh, a little thing in Publishers Weekly. The Random House was starting out a new digital-only imprint that was focused on fantasy, science fiction, horror, basically speculative fiction. So I saw it. The day I, I saw it, I went to their website, which was barely put together yet, and I saw the submission process, sent it off. And by this point, I didn't expect anything to happen. I mean, my, my soul had been crushed under the boot heel of New York Publishing for so long that I, I really had just sort of given up. And as a side note, what I should have been doing, uh, in retrospect, is just writing another damn book instead of focusing so much on getting this one published. Because by now, I might have three or four out there instead of one and two more to come. So all of a sudden one day I'm sitting at work and my email, boom, submissions at high Random House pops up. I click on it and it was a kind of a real simple, straightforward email that said, hey, we would like to um, take a look at the rest of this. Can you please send us the full manuscript? Well, you know, within probably about three minutes they had the full manuscript. I mean, I was, I was on fire to get this to them. And then in roughly a week, I got an email from the editor. She said, hey, we love it. You know, I, I, I would really, I'd really like to represent this. And um, if, if, if you'd like that, I'll send the contract today. Once again, Lakeside House is being built in my mind. Film rights have sold. Maybe, maybe HBO you know, miniseries or something at this point. And so uh, I get the contract. You know, talk to my agent. He's like, eh, it's not the greatest contract. Um, one thing, it doesn't give you, uh, it doesn't have a reversion of rights in the clause. That means they owned this forever in perpetuity. So he said, you know, I make sure you get reversion of rights. He, he looked over it. He gave me the language to ask for. So I, I went back to them and said, you know, it is kind of a little bit of a grabby sort of contract. And uh, my agent says, you know, he would like a reversion of rights. And they said, oh, sure, you know. So their lawyer changed it, fixed it, sent back the contract, sent it to Matt again. Matt said, hey, man, it's not a great contract, but you know what? Do it. You've waited this long. Just go for it. So I go for it. The day after I signed that contract and sent it back in, I mean, you know, uh, if I was obnoxious before about talking about getting an agent and having my book, you know, now like I have a contract with a random house, baby, you know. Yeah, it's digital only, but they, this is one of the big, you know, 
sixth and now is the big five. Well, uh, does anyone, is anyone familiar with the Science Fiction Writers Association or CIFWA? They've, okay, there's a group, you know, it's a lot of big name science fiction writers belong to this group. There's a writer named John Scalzi, S-C-A-L-Z-I. It's like a fairly big, outspoken, you know, science fiction writer. He writes a blog post about how Hydra, this new imprint from Random House, is the most obnoxious threat to writers and writing and publishing that has come down the pike since he can remember. I mean, it is, he used more four letter words in his rant about Hydra than I probably use in a month and I have some fairly salty language habits. And was just ripping how in the world, he didn't say it that way, but how in the world could a major publisher try to screw over writers like they were screwing over? I had just signed my contract and sent it back in. Okay, of course, one of the things he mentioned was the, the rights, reversion of rights, which my agent had gotten me. So, so they were willing to, to work with this. But you would think that there was Satan himself that was sitting behind the desk at Hydra writing up these contracts and you had to sign your own blood. So here I see my dream once again, you know, turning into crap. You know, and just falling apart. And I've just signed away everything to this predatory publisher, which is worse, worse than a vanity publisher. I mean, it went on and on and on. And you read the comments, which I shouldn't have, you know, comment sections anywhere on mine, basically the, you know, the ninth circle of hell. And I, I, was, I was just convinced that I'd done the stupidest thing possible. And part of this contract, too, that Scalzi didn't like was instead of getting an advance Okay, I gave up an advance on this contract. It was a new model where instead of getting an advance in like say 25% for ebooks, which is kind of the standard now, 15% for paperback, it was, it was more of what they call a profit sharing model. So they were going to give me basically 50% of what the book made and take, take their 50% and then they take, actually it was like more like 40, uh, 50 because they would take 10% off the top and put that into cost of marketing and things like that. The way they looked at it was like a profit sharing model. The way Scalzi and a lot of people in the field looked at it was they're, they're ripping you off and this is horrible. So Random House actually listened to this outcry and they said, we're not, we're not trying, we're, we're willing to negotiate, which I had already found out, which they had been willing to negotiate. So they actually implemented a model with an advance in the contract and they offered it to me and I said, you know what, but it would be an advance, a small advance, but it was an advance and then I would get 25% uh, royalties on each copy sold. And I said, you know what, I actually, I talked to my agent and I said, no, so I'll stick with the 50%, the you know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So um, I'll fast forward a little bit. That was what it took to get into publication. So then the book comes out. Um, and I'm so glad that I went with a traditional publisher. I'll give you a few reasons why it worked well for me. Is that first of all, they did a bang up cover. A really nice cover. Um, I, I, I thought it was spectacular. I have artist friends. I'm not sure they could have done this. I'm not sure I could afford a really nice cover. And they actually consulted with me on it. I, I didn't like the font. They changed the font, you know. I, 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 I thought um, that the text was too close to the edge. Stuff like, they, they completely worked with me back and forth, back and forth. They were fantastic. The editing process was so good and so solid and so detail oriented. They caught things that I'd missed, my agent had missed, other editors who read it had missed. I mean, they, they, it was so meticulous. And then the promotion. Now, I won't say I wish they could have done more promotion for me. Because I think anyone who's had a book published, you always want more than your publisher is going to wind up giving you. And you really do have to do as much as you can nowadays as well. Uh, you know, it, it really is more of a partnership than it, than it has been in the past. But, uh, you know, they, 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 they got this on NetGalley. I don't know if you're familiar with NetGalley. NetGalley is, um, and if you're a book blogger, if you're a librarian, something like that, you can, you can sign up for NetGalley and you get a digital galley of a book before it comes out. So I had lots of people requesting that through NetGalley. 
But the best thing they did for me, and I, any of you who are publishing ebooks, I cannot recommend this highly enough, is a newsletter called Book Bub. I don't know if any of you 